Good afternoon. Welcome to the tea table. I am so happy you've joined me on this beautiful, fabulous, August, sunny day. I had to put my sunglasses on because it was so bright, but I think I'll take them off now so I can see you just a little better. And are you having a beautiful summer? I am so enchanted with a recent book I have been reading and I want to share it with you. And it goes with the theme of our tea talk today. And I'm calling this, well, first of all, let's start. If you haven't gotten your tea yet, please pause and get your cup of tea and your best china cup and I'll be waiting for you. Okay, well I want to show you the tea tray today and it's all beautiful pink and it's very, very British and very old and it's actually the pot I'm using is a chocolate pot and they were very, very popular turn of the century. Chocolate was, well actually more like almost 200 years ago when chocolate was discovered it was such a hit that those that could afford it would have chocolate, hot chocolate, early in the morning. And so this is what this lovely pot when you see a pot that shape, it is called a chocolate pot. And it became very popular in Great Britain and throughout Europe. And I've chosen a romantic theme with a magenta cup. I love this magenta. And I'm going to pour out. Oh, I have to adjust where it comes out. They have a special way that you to keep it, whoops, to keep it hot. So there is a cup for you. I'm going to give you a little milk. Okay, and your cup will be right here just for you. And I have a matching, whoa, the, I've had my little cups out here and some trees, little tree things blew in going to have a cup for me. I love tea outside and we're going to talk about that today. And this, I want to show you this little creamer and sugar are very old and they were originally meant to sit on a teapot like you know, you put them on a teapot like that and it would fit. And then you would have everything together, which was a perfect way of getting things outside on a nice tray. Now I added this darling little, it can either be a creamer or a baby teapot. And it has the beautiful dogwood and that magenta color, which I just, it's the color. Remember, 2023 is magenta. And it's so wonderful. It seems to go with everything. And let's try our tea, okay? Mm, it's British tea today. Well, it's of course, from the east. Mm. And I have a darling little tea tin I want to show you called Royal Palace Tea. And this was done by Harney and Sons. This is an old tin, but it's got all of the symbol and it's the tea that Queen Elizabeth II, the late queen, had in Buckingham Palace. And in here I have, like I said, I used all the tea, but I have a bag of tea from Murchies. 
which is the Empress tea. So we're very British today, all the way around. And that is what we are going to actually talk about. And I think in order, I think I'm going to put the pot there and my cup here so I can take a little sip. Isn't this just beautiful? Well, I'm wearing white on white and I found this choker which is made out of, I think, shells and then a little carved, maybe stone. And it's so easy to put on. I thought, why don't they make more jewelry like that? You just put it right on your neck and it holds on with no clasp. So there's so many whites, just like there's so many reds and there's so many blues. We think of white as a distinctive color that is its own. Well, even this hat I'm wearing, this is a very white band and then touches of white with almost an ecro. And this scarf is supposed to be pure cotton white, but next to this white, white dress, it has a little cream tone. And this has a little cream with the white. And I just think the whites are so wonderful for summer. And the British women did also. Now, I'm going to tell you the music I'm playing today. It's George Friedrich Handel. And you know, he lived during the time right before the American Revolution in the 1700s. And he lived in England. And if you ever read his biography, fascinating. He was one of those extremely gifted, extremely discouraged artist living in poverty when a knock came at the door and someone brought him the librato or the words to Messiah. And then he sat in his room and felt anointed of God for three weeks. He composed the Messiah, which we all know Handel's Messiah. So he did this in London, though he was German. Well, then he stayed in London and he became very, very popular and he didn't have the financial issues. He married and had a much better life. Well, the king, King George, yes, that King George during the American Revolution wanted royal music for the crowning. And he was going down the Thames River in the boats, the Floetta, and he wrote the famous Handel's water music for that. And it's quite a long, and I'm playing that in the background because the British people really feel it's their very own and Handel dedicated it to the king. Oh, I wish you could see what I see. It's a little hummingbird and he's actually being still. <gasps> he's looking for something to drink and I think my husband's bird feeder has ran low. Oh my, I'm sorry little bird. I will tend to you as soon as I'm done with tea talk he's trying to get something out he needs it now okay isn't it interesting all of god's creation needs has such needs and the liquid water is so important which is the base of tea yes and i think that one can stay hydrated drinking tea if you have a i was reading watermelon and bananas have all the electrolytes and so you don't have to drink those sugary gatorades drink tea and have watermelon and you'll be fine well i'm going to show you the bag i have and then pull the book out i brought a bag that i thought goes so perfect with this it has the bamboo handles and it's woven so it's made out of all natural ingredients. And I am pulling out two books because they are by the same author, authoress. 
so here's the size of the bag. It holds my book, wonderful travel bag if you're going to little shops and want to put something in. It's a wonderful bag and it's perfect. It matches my outfit. Well, these books, this is the book that I love. It's called Women of the Raj, The Mothers, Wives, and Daughters of the British Empire in India by Margaret Macmillan. And there's a picture of it. This was published within the last 20 years. And the cover picture are two women in India. And they were so amazing, these people. I did not fully, you know, we see the pictures and um, you can watch movies on them. You can watch the, you know, the famous movie. Well, it, it involves actually a missionary, Catherine Hepburn and out of Africa. But that's partially that era. And these women, to go to the India or Africa during the days of empire, well, I was just reading her introduction and her foreword, and she is a fabulous writer. She's a doctor in history from Oxford. She is related to, by marriage and then by maternal side, to one of the recent prime ministers. And then her sister is married to the famous BBC historian Snow and his son that do a lot of, so she's very steeped and her research for this book is phenomenal. I was looking at all her research. She was in Canada doing research. She did it in England. She did it in India and Africa. And she actually went, her grandmother was one of these women of the Raj. Now, I didn't know Raj, R-A-J, was what they called the British people that went, the company of them that went out to India to bring um, trade. And then the missionaries came and then they brought education and they were, they built schools, they built hospitals, and they built churches. Well, I, we, we just take it so casual. We see the ladies in white, like I'm wearing, and it's because, and the thin fabric like this, this gauzy cotton. I tell you on these very hot days, it is the coolest fabric. I know why they wear it. And so these women, there were three different divisions. There were missionary women that went out alone and some married, uh, were married, married couples, or some were single. Then there were groups of women that went, they called them fishers, fishing, because they were out to look for a husband because there were a lot of men out there and not very many women. Now that was a smaller group, but the majority of the women that went were married to men that were assigned by the king and to and the queen later to go out and take care of India and supervise and help. And so she starts back in the 1600s when after, remember, Elizabeth I, the daughter of Henry VIII, good Queen Bess, the one that became queen for so many years, 50 some years. And she never married, but she established, is giving credit for establishing the British Navy. Well, when these Navy men went out on ships and went out on their exploration, that is when they found the spices, the tea, the coffee, they brought it back. Well, everyone wanted more. And that was the very, very beginning. And she talks about 
There were some women that went on those ships, but that was a very rough voyage. Oh my. You never knew if you were going to come back. Well, then she goes into the 1700s, which was more of the real beginning of the trade because they wanted the coffee, they wanted the tea. So the business people would build tea plantations or coffee plantations, but then you had to have government being established. So you had all of the military people going to help establish. So these wives were well provided for, but they were leaving their home. And many of them had no idea what they were getting. Most of them didn't know what they were going to face because England is a very temperate climate generally stays between 50 to 70 degrees. The summer it'll get a little hotter, the winter a little colder. And four seasons, well-built homes, and communities, a lot of community, the church, the school, the and especially the aristocratic people, the aristocracy, they had their circles of friends and I was thinking of the music. Now, there was no record players in the 1700s. So every, all the music would have been live, but people learned instruments and learned to play and would get music and play Handel's beautiful music. Well, she tells about the adventures. I believe there was a point where it would take two months, over two months to go from ship from England to India. Now, she alludes to Africa because it had to go around the, the horn, but the storms were so treacherous and you could get a hurricane that would come up like that and the ship would go back and forth. There were even people that fell off the ship and never made it because of bad weather. And then she said by halfway through the trip, the food would be running out they would try to go into port, but the water was getting bad. The food was running out. One lady was pregnant on the ship. She survived, her baby survived, quite a miracle. I mean, these, this was, it, she opens your eyes to really what these people went through. And then when they get there, it's just teeming with people. The sun is beating down. There are no houses like theirs they have to start building houses and there's no air conditioning. They have to figure out how to have fans. It's 100 degrees and they bring their tea cups, their tea pots, and they always have tea. And I think one of their survivals is having tea. And then as it grows and into the 1800s by the Victorian era, it is like established communities there, beautiful buildings. However, the rule was they could not keep the child with them after the age of seven. They wanted the child, all British children, properly educated. So the mothers had to send their children back on a boat to England to go to school and not see them for maybe a year or more. Hardship. Now, I haven't even gotten into the heart of the book. I probably shouldn't be giving a report on it yet. But I'm so, I stayed up till two in the morning just with, I couldn't put it down. I was so fascinated. And I think as we grow older ourselves and we realize what life is made of and how critical community is and keeping the family together saying goodbye to your loved ones and maybe never seeing them again quite a bit of sacrifice truly and then there were dangers there because there were native people that did not like them coming or were afraid of them and so they had to be careful but most of them were they had very good relations with the Indians and uh, East Indians and they worked together and there were some women that were quite fascinating that created unique little communities and took the lemonade of their life and 
turned it, I mean, took the lemons in the life and turned it into lemonade. And that's why I thought, I've got to tell you because I'm sure I found this book at my children's little thrift shop I go to. It was only a few dollars. I just loved the picture and inside, you could get this. Probably it's for sale. Women of the Raj, R-A-J. Well then, it says this woman is famous because she had written a book, Paris 1919. And her subtitle for that was, The War That Ended Peace. I thought that sounds familiar. I think I have that book. I went upstairs to my library and there is her other book. I have both her books. And on the cover, that's Winston Churchill when he's young and Kaiser Wilhelm, the German king that started World War I. And then on the back, there's a picture of the Paris Versailles. And I have been so fascinated as a historian myself with World War I. I mean, I've traveled to Europe, and you can't go to Europe, you can't go to the museums and not just be so wanting to know why, how, what, who, where, particularly in Austria. You go to Austria and you see the beautiful palace. You see the, um, oh my goodness, Sissy, the last Austrian princess. And when my daughter and I went in 2011 to her violin camp, we were in Vienna. And do you know the last Habsburg died? The, he, the one that would have been the king, the crown prince, and Karl. And, you know, because they lost their throne. And that's why she's writing that book, The War That Ended Peace, World War I basically almost all the thrones of Europe disappeared. Germany was gone and that's really why we got World War II because there was a vacancy and Winston Churchill said don't take the German Kaiser, don't take the throne away, remove him but make a constitutional monarchy like Britain because if not there's a vacuum and something evil will come and fill the vacuum and it did. And that's how Adolf Hitler got in, because there was such a vacuum in Germany. Well, in Austria, Austria, Vienna, because they had a relationship with Kaiser Wilhelm, they got involved in that World War I. They didn't really want to. They were, the emperor was trying to avoid it at all costs. They could, and they just got into it, and so tragic. And they lost their throne. They're, they're the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And, you know, Sissy was the last beautiful Austrian princess. And, well, actually Empress. She became Empress. That, there's a title of a book that I love and a film series on her. And Austria was very influential. When you go to Vienna, you see the palaces. There's nothing quite like it and all of the design of Vienna. It's a very logical city. They say it's the most popular city in all of Europe. It's an easy city to navigate. It's built on a circle because it's built around, way around the circle would be the old moat that would have been the walls, which don't exist now, of course. But then all the roads go into the center like a wheel. So it's really easy to go to Vienna and understand where you're going, what you're seeing. And Sissy was so beautiful. She was considered the most beautiful woman in the world. She married when she was only 16. She was a Bavarian princess. And then she was so beloved. And there's a whole museum in Vienna called the Sissy Museum, really worth going to. But, so this woman, this Margaret Macmillan, has written two books on two subjects that I absolutely am so interested in. And they're subjects that are so big 
and so vast, we will never know it all. And it's a wonderful challenge to be able to read her perspective. Now, I have not read at all the World War I book, the one that is Paris 1919 and the war that ended peace. I have not read that. I have been so busy with my other studies of my church history. Um, but I want to get into that book eventually, but now I'm in Women of the Raj, R-A-J. And I thought I'm going to just dress today and have tea in their memory of these great women that went out fearlessly. I've written a few boats. Well, I have ridden. I, rid, I rode a boat once down from Juneau, Alaska, and I was very young, all the way down to Vancouver, BC. It took two days and two nights. And it wasn't a ferry, it was a ship. And it was on the inland passage of Alaska, and it, it was basically fairly safe, but it could, we hit a storm once and it was rocking and rolling on. I got very seasick. And that's just a tiny taste. And then I've been on ferries. We have a lot of ferries in Washington State. And I've been on the ferry going to Victoria, BC from Port Angeles. That only takes an hour. But I was on a boat ride then, once in April, when the whole boat, the, it goes through the Straits of Juan de Fuca, where the ocean comes in and meets the Puget Sound, or I should say the Puget Sound where I'm at right here, the very beginning goes around and winds all around through the islands, through the San Juan Islands and up through Vancouver Islands, and then it goes out to the Pacific. Well, that's called the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And those straits can be very treacherous back because there's a lot of rumbling. Well, this boat we were on, I've never had an experience. I, I thought it was all over. The boat went all the way on its side, the safari, and then it turned around and went all the way on the other side. I'm serious, we were laying like this. Then the captain turns it in and we go all the way down. And then we come all the way up. And I was, I must have been white as a sheet. And a little Norwegian man sitting nearby he said, yeah, you got to be careful of the Straits of Juan de Fuca. They can be treacherous, but we're fine. <laughs> oh, thank God we're fine. I'm never getting on another boat again in my life. That's what I felt like. But I had no choice because we had to, in two days, come back on the same boat. But that was the worst. And then I've been on boats up in northern Scotland and Ireland. You have to take boats to the Hebrides and out to to Ireland you take a boat from England but and I've taken the boat across the channel and then a boat once up to Norway but those were all basically you can see the shore you're close to shore but this boat that these people went on you look at the map from England to India around the Cape they said there was one way you could go a little short shorter and that would be through the the Suez Canal and overland, but that was very dangerous. There were roving pirates and gangs. It was dangerous. It was safer to go on the boat, on the ship. And then another interesting thing she said, I found this fascinating. She's reading letters of women. They said, the captain is so charming and happy when he's on land, he greets you and welcomes you. You feel so jolly and happy. And once he's on the ship, he's as stern as a pike and he's impossible to talk to or deal with. He is just, and then I was talking to my husband about that. He said, because on a ship, the captain is completely, it's a, he is the law. He is the order. He is responsible. It's like a little world. He, he has to do it all. So of course he's gonna be very serious and may come across a little grim, but you're just thankful if he gets you there safely, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> what a tea talk. I hope you've enjoyed this. 
I tell you, we have so much to be thankful for. We live very, very easy lives compared to the people of the past. And that's why the life expectancy for these women that went out, they might make it to their 50s, their 60s. That was pretty good. Some lived to be old, but then they would go back to England. But I tell you, uh, it's another world. And it's good for us to know so we reflect on our blessings and if you are facing something hard that you don't want to face it could be relationships it could be people it could be a job you have to do you just don't want to do it you know what we have to do we have to stand up straight and say i'm not a victim I am going to do my best. I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to make this thing happen. And I'm going to do the best with the lemons to make lemonade. And I was talking to someone this morning and they have relatives coming to visit that they don't really want to see right now. And I said, well, you know, you have to just make it work. You have to make it work for you. You have to have fun. Laugh and have fun. And don't get so serious. Think outside of the box. Do something good for yourself during the visit that you really want to do. Take care of yourself. Don't just be a slave because even the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. We can't love anyone unless we love ourselves and let God love us. We let God love us. We receive his love. We give it back. That's called worship. And then we accept that he has made us in his image for his purpose. And when things come into our lives, they're for his plan. And we're going to take all the strength we have and make it as happy as it can possibly be. And I was thinking of Lucy Ball. Why do you think she laughed so much? She had a father. They lived in the depression. They were really poor. And her father said, Lucy, we're not going to be down. We're going to laugh our way through this. We're going to make it. Then I thought of Groucho. Groucho Marx was Jewish. He was one of about I don't know, 10 children, but there were six or seven brothers. And they all lived in a little tiny apartment in New York. They were immigrants. And he had aunts and he had uncles and he had people with so many opinions. And you talk about family. You talk about people telling you what to do. <laughs> you can only imagine the yentas and the advice. He took that and turned it into comedy. Those Marx Brothers were doing just what they had to do in life to make it. That's why everybody loves them. They can relate to them. Lighten up. Don't expect too much out of others. And don't even expect too much out of yourself. Just be grateful for the good things that are coming from you, from me, from others, and look for the jewels. Look for the gold. Keep our eyes up. Look for the sun, and the sun will shine on you. Thank you so much for joining me. And I did have a little treat. I didn't know if you noticed. Just tell you what it is. I made them myself. They're probably the healthiest thing I've ever had on the tea table. Little banana bran blueberry muffins. And if you have, there, I'll show you the little plate they're on. It's very sweet. If you haven't subscribed to my channel and you like the tea talks, please subscribe so you will be notified. And please push the notification button and then share with a friend and 
if you have liked it, push the little like. And I love all of your comments. I cherish them. They are so edifying to me. So please feel free to comment. And thank you so much for joining me. I pray you have a fabulous week. Take over. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. That's what Deuteronomy says. Take it. Make something beautiful happen for yourself, for God, and for others. Thank you. Have a fabulous day.